All right, so we're doing our next section of the bugs and drugs will hopefully be the conclusion of this. The next group we'll talk about are going to be our monobactams, and this is going to continue our medications that are working against bacterial cell wall synthesis. So um, again, you can still see that beta-lactam ring, uh, that kind of square structure uh, that's right on there. Um, the only agent that falls into this category is going to be astreonam, otherwise known as zactam. Yes? Yeah, so the, if I put it in parentheses, that's going to be the trade name or the, the brand name. Okay. Um, I will always kind of refer to things as the uh, generic name first, or the chemical name. Okay. And the generic is before the parentheses. I'm sorry? The generic name is before the parentheses. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that'll be my traditional convention for that. Yes. Yeah, so you'll have a kind of wide-ranging category of cephalosporins, and then you'll have kind of subcategories in there. So your fifth generation, your third generation. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so as trianam, this one has kind of a unique um, set of coverages. Um, so we saw, you know, a lot of our cephalosporins, a lot of penicillins had gram-positive, gram-negative coverage. This one exclusively only covers for gram-negatives, including pseudomonas. And so if we will, we'll look at um, some another class of drugs called the aminoglycosides, and this has a very similar um, coverage in that it really focuses on the gram negatives, including the ever uh, popular pseudomonas. Um, lots of good coverage against other enterobacteriaceae, um, but no gram positive, no anaerobic activity. So the place where this fits into therapy is really that um, you know, we talked a little bit about cross sensitivity between penicillin allergy and cephalosporins and stuff. Um, even if you had someone who was uh, you know allergic to penicillins uh, to, at a true type one anaphylactic reaction, they're allergic to cephalosporins. As trianam is uh, basically there's no cross reactivity there. So this is a very safe medication to give uh, for patients who have allergies. But keep in mind you're losing a lot of coverage for gram positives uh, and any kind of anaerobic coverage for exclusive gram negatives. Um, this is still going to be a renally adjusted medication, so you need to check renal function and dose accordingly. Um, again, nothing real special as far as monitoring goes, and again, no cross-reactivity here. So this is going to be a really good um, point. So if you have a patient who's really super allergic to everything else, you can definitely get away with utilizing um, estriam if it's appropriate uh, for the infection you're trying to treat. Uh, the next group is going to be our carbapenems. These are still going to be our beta-lactams, but um, you see this is a little bit more wide-ranging group. We have imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem, and doripenem. Uh, and these guys I like to call our gorilla cellins. Um, these treat just about everything. They are very, very good broad-spectrum antibiotics. And so um, really the only thing they don't have a good coverage for would be things like MRSA. Like MRSA would not be covered by this medication. But gram-negatives, good gram-positive coverage, and anaerobes would be covered by your carbapenems, including uh, pseudomonas with one exception, and that would be ertapenem. So ertapenem you will not see used for pseudomonas coverage. Um, the place that you'll see these being used are going to be typically reserved for more resistant infections. So this is not a, a group of drugs you want to jump to as your first line. This is like your cultures come back and it's resistant to everything and you got to use one of these guys. So these are like really resistant pseudomonases that are producing these extended spectrum beta-lactamases because these still have a lot more resistance to that based on their chemical structure. Um, the only thing they're really susceptible to that you'll run into are these things called KPCs or Klebsiella producing carbapenemases. And that makes sense because these are carbapenems, so carbapenemase would probably you know, render these inert. Um, so you'll see these used a lot in the ICU for things like nosocomial infections, so a secondary pneumonias to you know, ventilator um, placement, things like that. Meningitis this is another good coverage because it has good penetration. Um, and a lot of times you'll, we talked about uh, restricted antibiotics, and a lot of times in the hospitals you'll see that this is going to be one of those restricted ones um, because um, you don't want to overuse these because then at that point if you overuse these guys and they're resistant you got nothing else to go to as far as a lot of gram negatives go so um, very judicious use of this is, is uh, recommended for your carbapenems You'll see your dosing is going to be uh, very similar to a lot of your other medications that fit into this uh, uh, beta-lactam group. So again, every six hours. So again, these are going to be ones that are going to be more time-dependent killers. Um, one thing to note as far as monitoring goes, or as far as, uh, you know, these again are all renally adjusted uh, medications. But one thing to note here is that imipenem um, kind of doesn't use very often because of the fact that it is more prone to seizures if you have patients who have renal dysfunction and they accumulate this drug. 
Uh, if you don't adjust for that, then you run a risk of having a decreased seizure threshold and then patients can develop that. Um, so oftentimes you'll see meropenem kind of being the go-to carbapenem in this group. Um, I haven't seen imipenem used in some time, but it probably depends on what, um, you know, where you're working at. So that's it for the beta-lactams. Now we'll continue on with our cell wall synthesis inhibitors, but instead we're going to look at uh, something that works through a little different mechanism. This is what we call vancomycin. Has anyone heard of vancomycin before? Yeah, so it's a pretty common one you'll see, especially working EDs and places like that. You'll see them like get a, get a dose of vancomycin on board, send them upstairs, and forget about them, right? Um, so you'll see this used pretty pretty frequently. Um, vancomycin, the way that this one is going to work is that it's not a beta lactam, so it's not really susceptible to beta lactamases like you would see with some of your penicillins or cephalosporins. Um, this is going to be working through a similar mechanism by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis because it works to block that cross linking that occurs between those peptidoglycan walls. So again, it's going to be binding these two D-alanines. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with penicillin binding protein, so again, it misses those um, those resistance mechanisms uh, because it has no interactions there, um, and so it retains uh, retains activity for you know a broader spectrum of bacteria because it, the, the resistance just really the mechanisms aren't really there. Not to say you can't have resistant bugs to vancomycin. We'll talk about those in a little bit later. So this will have gram positive only coverage. But this is probably going to be one of the first ones we'll talk about um, that is used very commonly for MRSA. So this is going to be a good one for MRSA. Um, you'll see it a lot of times used sometimes if you have patients who are undergoing surgery and they need surgical prophylaxis. You may see if they have an allergy to penicillin or to cephalosporins, they may give vancomycin instead. Because again, if you remember what kind of bacteria are mainly growing on the skin. Yeah, you know, staff, strap, things like that. So this is good coverage for a lot of those. So sometimes you'll see vancomycin being used for that. Um, the other thing to note is that vancomycin, you saw on that picture of the structure, it's a very large molecule, so it's very difficult, uh, difficult for it to be absorbed from the GI tract. And so it really has no oral absorption whatsoever. It really is only going to be given by, uh, by IV administration. The big thing to note, though, is that you have one other indication you can use this for, and you guys have heard uh, Clostridium difficile infections, right? Those are usually secondary to antibiotic administration. You can use the PO form or the oral form of vancomycin in order to treat C. diff infections. Cannot use the IV form because there doesn't really get any appreciable levels within the GI tract to treat that local uh, infection. You'll see a medication a little bit later we'll talk about where you can use either IV or PO to treat C. diff, but vancomycin can only be used to treat C. diff by the oral route. Yes. How is that because it just pretty much stayed in the GI? Exactly. It's such a big molecule, it has a tough time crossing the, the GI epithelia. Yeah, so the fifth generation cephalosporins are really, really new medications. So they're really expensive. We don't have a lot of um, experience with them. They're also, the cephalosporins have very broad coverage. Um, so you don't want to use those unless you really need to. You kind of want to reserve those ones um, to prevent resistance patterns from popping up. Vancomycin, though, because it's a little bit more um, targeted towards your gram positives, um, if you know that that's the, what you're really focusing on, then use vancomycin. So vancomycin is an older drug and it's used very, very frequently. So um, especially if you have like, you know, little old ladies coming in from nursing homes to the ED, um, you oftentimes will be treating for, you kind of cover empirically for um, both really resistant gram negative. So you'll see a couple meds on for that, but then you'll see vancomycin for gram positives like MRSA. So vancomycin is, is probably your number one go-to um, IV medication for MRSA. We'll talk about a few others that have good coverage and you can use them orally, but vancomycin, if you have a really sick patient who's coming in, you're worried about gram-positive infections like MRSA, um, then vanco is going to be the one you go to. And then if you, you know, get your cultures back and realize that it's, you know, um, MSSA, or if you realize it was some other, something you didn't really need vanco for, you can um, taper off of that and go on to something else, right? Um, this is also good for things like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, other places where you're expecting to see um, gram-positive bugs uh, being grown. Um, so this is one of those medications, and we talked about, uh, I think we mentioned it, uh, there's a, the term narrow therapeutic index. You guys remember what that is? What does that mean? It's more dangerous. It's more dangerous because the dose that it's effective at and then the dose you get toxic at is relatively close together, right? We want medications that um, you'd have to take, you know, 10 times the therapeutic dose in order to cause toxicity. That would be a nice wide therapeutic index. This does not have that. And so that means we have to do therapeutic drug monitoring on this medication, which basically means that we're measuring blood levels of the drug to make sure we're keeping within uh, appropriate ranges. Now, vancomycin is again going to be one of those time-dependent uh, killers 
So if you had to imagine, uh, would you be measuring peak levels of this drug or would you be measuring trough levels? Peaks. Think peaks? Troughs. Trough. Why do you think troughs? Oh, because you want to make sure you don't go under the... Exactly. You want to make sure you don't get underneath the MIC. We don't really care um, what the peak levels are. We do care from the toxicity standpoint, but if we're just measuring troughs, we can at least make sure that they're not accumulating the drug, and that would tell us that you know our peaks are probably too high anyway. So this is a drug that we would just be measuring troughs on, and so if you ever see anyone ordering a vancomycin peak, you probably should be questioning that and saying, like, mm, what are you doing that for? What is that really telling you? Um, because you know that the way that this is killing the bacteria, that doesn't really make sense. You don't care what the peak level is. So a lot of times you'll see that the goal... Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. So for a given patient, um, you know, a lot of times we have uh, the idea of like volumes of distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, those are kind of based on population kinetics. So for every drug, you know, you have a baseline volume of distribution you would expect. So um, assuming your patient has a normal volume of distribution for that drug, um, if I give a certain milligram per kilogram dose, I can expect a certain peak level, right? I can I can calculate that out based on um, pharmacokinetic data, right? I didn't do pharmacodynamics with these, so I don't want to get into all the, the math behind that. But basically, um, you can assume that the, the peak level is going to be a certain number based on your patient, right, by doing all the calculations. So the thing is, though, is if we're measuring our trough levels and it's too high, that tells us that the patient's not clearing it appropriately so that we know that our steady state level is going to be even higher than that. And so that's already kind of inferring to us that the peak levels are too high, right? By measuring the trough levels, we make sure that they're not accumulating too much of the drug, which can lead to toxicity, right? So we'll see with some other medications we do therapeutic drug monitoring on that we'll um, be measuring mostly troughs for because we just want to make sure they're not accumulating it. And so we'll, this that will be a good contrast agent to, to look uh, compared to this. So again, we're measuring troughs for this. Usually for a lot of things like, you know, more minor infections, if you're worried about like bloodstream infections, because that's an easy site to get to. If you're worried about... Um, it's like a cellulitis or something like that. Um, you can shoot for a gold trough of say 10 to 15 micrograms per ml. But for some indications, you would want to shoot for a higher trough because you want to make sure that the blood levels or the tissue levels are getting high enough, right? And we're using the blood as kind of a surrogate marker for that. So things like meningitis, right? We said meningitis is very difficult to penetrate um, and get to the CNS. So you'd want to shoot for higher troughs to show that that tissue level will be higher. For things like pneumonias, because getting into the lung tissue is very difficult, um, you want to shoot for higher levels. And even just you know, in general, the more sick your patient is, the more likely you are to shoot for a little bit higher concentration to make sure you're getting above that MIC and make sure you're killing off those bacteria. So really, that'll be indication dependent. You'll see that wherever you work, you'll have different um, dosing guidelines based on uh, the indications there. Um, a lot of times you'll see patients, uh, especially those that are very sick, they'll use loading doses in order to get them to steady state a little bit quicker. Because um, normally we would say check a trough before the third or fourth dose in order to make sure we're at steady state. And if you draw it too soon, you would expect your levels to be too low or too high. Yeah, so say like instead of before the, the fourth dose, where I can assume that I'm at steady state and I checked it before say the first dose. With my steady that level that I get, would that be falsely low or falsely elevated for what the steady state should be? Should be falsely low because remember you, when you get those repeated dosings, you're eventually going to see your levels kind of go up and up, and eventually it'll plateau out, right? Because that idea of being a steady state is that for any given dosing period, you're metabolizing the amount of drug that you're putting into the patient, right? And so if you change either of those factors, how much you're putting in or how much the patient's metabolizing, um, your steady state level will change. Um, but if I were to draw that level too early, my level will be falsely low, and I would say, oh, I need to give this patient more. And then when I actually get to that real steady state, I would check it and be way too high, right? So it's important not to check levels too early. Um, sometimes you'll have bugs that are just too resistant. So sometimes you'll look at the MIC. So you see on that first section for Staph aureus, if the MIC is less than one milligram per liter, um, then that's that's good enough to treat with. But sometimes you, the um, MRSA will be so resistant, um, say you have MIC greater than two milligrams per liter, that this is really it's going to be very difficult to achieve enough AUC above that MIC in order to really uh, achieve that good bacterial kill rate. In which case, sometimes you'll actually, even though the bug looks like it's sensitive you would have to switch it over to something else like an alternative agent like linazolid, which we'll talk about a little bit later, right? So again, just because a bug says it is um, you know, susceptible, um, sometimes you need, you need to look a little bit deeper, look at the MICs to make sure that um, it's not too high for the drug you're trying to use and, and potentially switch over to something else. So again, kind of 
the graph that we were talking about. So again, if I were to check the trough right before that first dose, right, that first little dip down there, um, that level would be too low and it would lead me to think I need to increase my dose or I need to give the drug more frequently. I mean, that wouldn't really be the case. If I waited till the third or fourth dose, you'd see I'm much closer to my steady state and that would give me a better idea of what I'm actually at, what the patient actually would ride at on the trough level, right? That makes sense for everyone? So um, I wouldn't uh, force you guys to memorize all this information, but just know that these are some of the updated dosing recommendations for vancomycin, just for reference. Um, note here that again, this one is renally cleared. So renal function is super, super important to assess whenever you're dosing a patient on vancomycin. So you can look here to see um, that you'll come up with kind of empiric recommendations based on your patient. So the loading dose doesn't really matter because you're just trying to get the patient up to a steady state level. But the big thing that will change is going to be how frequently you give the drug. So because it's renally eliminated, if I have good renal function, say a creatinine clearance greater than 70 mLs per minute, I can do Q8 hour dosing. So you get three times a day. If they start to dip down, that's where you would see I need to extend my dosing interval to say every 12 hours to make sure that trough does not accumulate too much and my levels are too high. And then I would go even further from that. And in some cases, if you have a patient who say is, you know, really poor renal function, say they're on dialysis and they haven't received in a few days, uh, what I might actually do is even just give them a one-time dose. And then I would check them at random levels, say, uh, say you know, 48 hours, 72 hours. And then when they get down to an actual trough that would be therapeutic, then I'd redose them. And then you just do kind of random levels at that point in order to kind of uh, make sure they're not accumulating too much. And again, the whole reason we don't want them accumulate is because we want to avoid toxicity, which we'll talk about in just uh, probably the next slide. How do you tell someone's at a true trough? Based on the time that they've been receiving the drug. So if you remember, we talked about half-life that it takes roughly four to five half-lives in order for a drug to reach steady state. As long as you're given the same amount of drug and you're giving it the same frequency, as long as the patient's clearance of the drug has not changed, which you can assume is, you know, we should be staying steady, um, then by that four to five half-lives, should be a steady state. So I know that by the time I've given three or four doses of the drug, I should be at steady state at that point, right? Um, now say for instance, you're dosing a patient, um, you know, say they're, they have pretty stable renal function, you're dosing them with vancomycin, you have a good trough, you know, you don't have to check that every dose. You can check that say once a week, once they're steady. But say you get a, a Chem 7, it comes back and your serum creatinine has jumped up, say it's doubled. Now all of a sudden you have an idea, okay, well, Something's going on with the renal function. Maybe they're hypovolemic. Maybe they're becoming septic, and their you know kidneys are hyperperfused. Whatever it happens to be, you know that clearance has gone down now, right? Because it's shown because they're not clearing creatinine very well. So at that point, you'd want to go ahead and recheck a trough to make sure they're not accumulating the vancomycin too, which they probably have been. And then you actually end up extending your dosing interval, say to every 12 hours or 24 hours. Um, so the big thing that we are worried about with vancomycin, uh, especially in regards to accumulation and toxicity, are going to be two organs. Uh, one's going to be ototoxicity. So you worry about having too high levels accumulating within the hair cells, which can cause some irreversible hair loss, uh, not hair loss, hearing loss. Um, I don't know, maybe it causes uh, hair loss if you get a high enough level, but not going to be testable. Um, Nephrotoxicity is going to be the other thing you worry about, especially when you're dosing this with other nephrotoxins. Um, I have a whole section that talks about acute kidney injury and things like that, but um, suffice it to say that you know if you have a septic patient who's already kind of prone to acute kidney injury, you have vancomycin on board, and then other nephrotoxins, all of those things can kind of combine to cause um, further kidney injury to happen here. So that's one of the, the two big things we're monitoring for and two big things we're going to be um, measuring those levels for. Other things to note when you're infusing vancomycin, uh, vancomycin used to be called Mississippi mud. It used to be this really kind of impure, really kind of nasty looking product. You probably would never want to infuse it into a patient. Uh, but since then, we've gotten better at um, you know uh, producing the drug. It's much more clear. Um, it's a much uh, more pure product. But you still have these infusion reactions that can occur. And so there's a syndrome called red man syndrome that happens from infusing vancomycin too quickly. So say you give a, a dose over an hour, patient you know, is complaining of being hot and itchy and they're red all over, um, that would be red man syndrome. I'm sorry? Is that the same as the Stevens-Johnson? No, so Stevens-Johnson's is a, an immune reaction to the presence of a drug. So basically you, you end up having like the skin sloughing, it's very, very much more severe. Um, red man syndrome is really more transient, it's gonna be really more related to um, infusing that vancomycin. You'll see it'll go away on its own after you were to stop the infusion, right? Um, the way that we combat that is actually to extend out the dosing, um, how, how we basically slow down how fast we're infusing it. So say instead of giving it over one hour, we give it over two hours, right? 
that still isn't working, then sometimes you have to premedicate with like you know um, histamines or, or corticosteroids. But usually, you can just extend out how long the infusion is, and that is enough to kind of prevent the red man syndrome from popping up. Yes. It's more of a side effect of the medication. So it's one of those things that's like it's expected. Like if you see it, it's no real cost for concern. You just have to know that your patient's more sensitive to that. And you just have to um, extend out how long you're giving it. Yep. Okay. Um, again, we said laboratory monitoring. Do trust before the third or fourth dose. Um, you see what our kind of usual gold trust will be. Um, and then we might do random levels. So especially if, you know, patient's renal function is really unstable or if it's really, really poor, um, then we might do random levels to assess when we can redose. So say, for instance, I were to dose a patient who's on, you know, in-stage renal disease, um, you know, the first day, you know, 24 hours out, I get a level and it's, say, 40. Okay, it's still too high. I get a dose the next day and it's 30. And then finally, the next day is 20. Then at that point, I would go ahead and redose because now they're therapeutic. Um, two questions. So, who does these checks before and post? And also, does the uh, clinician have to order these checks? Yep. Um, so that's a great question. Um, every place you work at will be different, right? So um, say you're working in the ED, you'll never have to worry about this. You'll give them a single dose and send them upstairs and, and you're done, right? You get one and done kind of treatment. Um, say you're working in the ICU, or say you're working on the med surge floor or something like that, um, you may be responsible for doing that. It depends on what kind of facility you're at. Um, in a lot of places, they will have pharmacist-driven um, antimicrobial stewardship programs and pharmacokinetic programs. So they'll actually do this for you. So say, for instance, like at Nemours, um, we had an independent protocol where um, if the provider ordered vancomycin in a consult for us to dose it, we would do independent order leveling. We would do independent dosing of it and just kind of give a heads up to the provider and say, hey, this is what's happening. The renal function decreased we changed the dose to this uh, this many hours um, you cool with that and they said yeah that's fine you go along with your day um, smaller institutions especially like non-educational uh, institutions you may be, be the one doing it right so it's important you don't screw it up so call your friendly pharmacist uh, and get some help with it because again this is not a um, it's more art than it is science in a lot of cases um, and patients will surprise you all the time so it's important to consult with people who have done more of this than you um, to make sure you don't screw it up because you really don't want to come back and have a trough you know a true trough of like 50 and be like, well, what the heck happened, right? Because then you could be liable for, for that. So, all right, only, I'm gonna harp on this so much because it is really important that um, it's a medication that's used very frequently. It's important to use it correctly. Otherwise you can lead to some patient harm. So maybe it's just me, but so in order to measure the troughs, is it just the blood draw? Mm -hmm. And then it's allowed, like it's just projected onto a bar graph or? No, it wouldn't be projected onto a bar graph. Basically, you would just say, um, you'd order, say, vancomycin, one gram every 12 hours, right? And you'd say, order a vancomycin trough before the third dose, okay? That level would come back, and it would, say, be 15, you know? And based on your protocols, based on your indication, 15 may be too high, maybe too low. 15 is probably, you know, is going to be a good number. And so if your trough is that number, whatever you're shooting for, then you're good to go. You can leave the dose alone, right? But say it comes back, and it's 25, well, now that's too high. Now you get to say, well, was it drawn correctly? Now you have to look at the time the med was given versus when the actual blood drawing was done. So maybe the nurse um, maybe goofed something up. Or maybe if it's too low, maybe the level is drawn too late, right? Maybe the patient was off the unit and was getting an MRI done, and so they couldn't um, have the level done at, at the appropriate time. Sometimes you have to use a lot of you have to use a lot of critical thinking in order to kind of assess those levels to see whether or not it's okay. But if the level comes back and it you know is drawn correctly and it's within range. Just leave it alone. But the yeah. levels come from like a standard that's given by the institution or just <coughs> by like farm? No, you would have, um, usually places will have kind of indications for, so say like meningitis, you're going to shoot 15 to 20. You know, for <laughs> septicemia, you're going to shoot for 10 to 15. You know, so they'll, they'll kind of set that up. You know, usually infectious disease and the antimicrobial stewardship committee will usually have input on that, um, you know, depending on where you're at. Otherwise, you would consult your, your drug references for that. And it's a very standard lab that you can get in any institution. So if it's below that 15, which was our goal trough, 15 to 20, then you would redose at that point? Yeah, so say, for instance, you got a level back, so you're dosing it, say, every eight hours, uh, and the level comes back and say, you're shooting for 15 to 20 because the patient's meningitis, okay? The level comes back and it's 12. Okay, like, well, that's too low. You assess it and say, okay, well, this was done appropriately. Then at that point, you can, can do one of two things. You can either give it more frequently, right, because that means the patient has less time to clear the drug, or you can change the dose, right? So at that point, I would probably say, well, 
you know, and, and you have to start thinking of logistics too. So like in a peds hospital, where usually the nursing to patient ratio is normally a lot higher, usually, you know, it's a little bit more like, you know, maybe one to two, one to three, if you're in the ICU, it could be one to one um, pretty frequently. They can get away with every six hour dosing. If I go to a general like med search floor in an adult facility and I tell you to give a medicine every six hours, Exactly. So a lot of times I'll end up increasing the dose. Like usually for adults, giving things more than um, every eight hours is kind of a, a, a trial, right? Especially if I have to infuse it over two hours to prevent red mans. Like these are all things you, you think about as you dose it over time. Um, yeah. So you know, either do, change the dose or change the frequency. So if you do this um, trough, one wall, um, trough at the third dosage, and it comes back at twelve. Hmm. That's a great question. That's a great question. Why should not? Why should I not do that? Starting over. Right. Because your patient's going to achieve a new steady state. So then I have to wait till the next. Uh, the you know I change my dose to something new. I wait till before that third dose, right? Or that third or fourth dose, and I would recheck that. That's really important to make sure you've achieved a new steady state before um, you go to changing your dose again. So if I you know change the dose before the third one, a patient got the fourth dose, and I get another trough, and it's you know not changed at all. I just haven't really done much, right? I'm just kind of wasting money at that point getting lab tests I don't need. Uh, can you just repeat the question? Yes, the question was um, you know if you were to uh, get a level before the third dose. It comes back low, and then you say, okay, I'm going to give, say, 10% more. Um, do I check the next trough before the fourth dose? And you don't want to do that because you're not at steady state yet. You still have to wait another four to five half-lives, which you know, usually equates around the third or fourth dose um, before you get to that, that new steady state. I just want to know, what's the abbreviation of TDM? That is therapeutic drug monitoring. Oh. Yep. Good question. Anything else? Um, not usually. Usually that patient has kind of announced themselves as far as to how they're going to be clearing that drug. So you can kind of assume that before the third dose, they, they've achieved the steady state. If it comes back like way too high, then you know that you're, even if you're not at steady state, you know you need to change that, that frequency of how often you're giving it or the dose, right? Um, so you'll, you'll kind of have an idea. And this is one of those things that like it sounds super nebulous when I talk about it. Like you do it a couple of times, it makes way more sense as soon as you do it, right? So yeah. Okay, just some pictures of red man syndrome, how that can uh, show up. Okay, moving on, that was all of our cell wall synthesis inhibitors. Now we're going to be moving on to our protein synthesis inhibitors. Again, on test purposes, uh, for testing purposes, I'm not going to ask you which specific ribosome that an uh, antibiotic is going to affect, because again, I really don't think you guys are going to need to know that in the clinical world. I will ask, does this inhibit protein synthesis? And I expect you to know that. Um, the reason why that the, these are effective for bacterial infections and not hurting our cells is because we are shooting uh, for different targets. So if you look at bacterial ribosomes versus mammalian ribosomes, they're different enough to where the, the antibiotics will react with those receptors and not with our receptors, right? So that's how we achieve some specificity um, between the bacteria and us. You'll even see that when we get to talking about things like um, oncologic drugs, you'll see that there's a lot of similar mechanisms to antibiotics that we're using, but the targets are just our cells, right? So that's why that you lose that specificity because we were wanting to target our own cells in order to get rid of those cancerous ones. But that'll be for a later, uh, uh, later topic. Um, anywho, so you'll see that um, these are some of our groups of medications we'll talk about. We'll get into more details on these in just a second. But essentially, they're blocking protein production within the cell. And so for the most part, would you think these are bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic? Static, exactly. These are going to be bacteriostatic for the most part because, again, the cell can still survive for some period of time uh, even though you're inhibiting this protein production. So, um, again, this is going to rely on your own immune system, your innate immunity, to come along and uh, wipe out the rest of the bacteria while they're being kind of inhibited from new growth. There are going to be some ex uh, one exception to that. Uh, there will be the aminoglycosides. Those are still going to be uh, bactericidal even though they follow a similar mechanism. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, the first group we'll talk about are going to be a very popular one. These are going to be our macrolides. Again, these are working against the 50S subunit and inhibits protein synthesis. Um, the three big ones in this category will be erythromycin. has several different dosage forms, including topical, IV, um, oral. You have clarithromycin, and you also have azithromycin. I'm sure everyone's heard of azithromycin before, right? That's your Z-packs. Uh, these have good coverage against your gram positives, uh, some gram negatives. You'll see it covers MSSA, but no MRSA coverage. Um, doesn't have kind of like really wide ranging gram negative coverage, so you don't see like pseudomonas coverage here. Um, but certainly this will get um, 
things like some of your atypical bugs as well. So you'll see things like um, you know mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, chlamydia, things like that will end up being covered by this. And so this is going to be, you'll see it's big niche, especially if you're in like primary care or family care, um, that this is good for atypical pneumonia. So like, you know, a patient comes in with pneumonia, um, a lot of times you'll be suspecting um, atypical bugs like mycoplasma. This is going to be a good group of drugs to go to. But because it is a good group of drugs to go to, it gets gone to very uh, too frequently, and we see a lot of resistance popping up to these drugs. So overuse is a huge thing with with, uh, with your antibiotics. Because again, if I go in saying, like, hey, I got bronchitis, I'll throw a Z-pack at me. If I go in, oh, I got sinusitis, throw a Z-pack at me. Because it'll cover all those bugs, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the time it's not appropriate because a lot of times the infections are due to viruses. Exactly. So we don't want to do that. Um, so you guys won't, won't do that in your clinical practice, right? All right. You have to sign a thing in blood before you leave. You won't overprescribe fluoroquinolones and macrolides. Anywho, um, so you'll see it used a lot for respiratory tract infections, so certainly community-acquired pneumonias, acute otitis media, uh, pharyngitis, sinusitis, chronic bronchitis, all kinds of different upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract infections. Um, this is also going to be good uh, for some skin and uh, skin soft tissue infections, um, probably not seen too, too frequently for that. Um, and then another uh, kind of unique use for it would be mycobacterium avium complex. This is actually an opportunistic infection you see more in patients um, that have like severe HIV or AIDS, um, say cancer patients who are really neutropenic. Um, this is a, a bacteria that you know we're exposed to all the time, but we don't get infections because we have a good immune system. Um, but this can be used either for prophylaxis, so preventing a, a MAC infection or as actual treatment for it as well. Um, you also see it used uh, for chlamydia, and then also um, erythromycin you see typically using things like um, you conjunctivitis and things like that. Cause we talk, we'll talk about topical um, ophthalmic products. You'll see erythromycin being used pretty frequently. Um, and then H. pylori. So you guys know what H. pylori causes? What does it cause? Yeah, gastric ulcer. So this is one of the combination drugs. Uh, have you guys ever heard the story of the guy, the doctor who figured out like, H. pylori? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would actually like, drink the bacteria himself and give himself ulcers. It's kind of interesting. So look up that story if you ever get a chance. Yeah, Nobel Prize. Everyone thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. Anywho, um, so side effects, uh, you will see that, you know, you get the typical nausea, uh, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain. You're going to see that um, this will be more pronounced, in, especially in children, younger patients. And a lot of this is due to the fact that you'll have some activity against these motilin receptors within the GI tract. So things like erythromycin especially, um, some agree azithromycin can activate these motilin receptors that have this kind of uh, prokinetic kind of force on the GI tract. So a lot of times you'll see patients who have, say, delayed emptying, delayed gastric emptying, say they have gastric paresis, you'll see erythromycin being used on a chronic basis in order to help stimulate the GI tract and kind of move things along its, uh, on its way. Um, so I see this a lot with like GI physicians and stuff, they'll be recommending erythromycin orally for a chronic basis, not necessarily for infection, but for that motility. Um, but again, that same thing is going to happen to all of your patients, so diarrhea can be a big uh, concern there. Um, some issues with uh, cholestatic hepatitis, not super common. Uh, and then you worry about uh, some transient hearing loss, especially with large IV doses, or if you have patients who have really poor renal function, um, that can be a cause uh, for concern. Uh, the other thing to note with your macrolides is QT prolongation. Has anyone heard of QT prolongation? Okay, so what does that predispose you to? Uh, torsades. Yeah, torsades. Anyone know what torsades is? Yes. What is it? Twisting of the point. So um, I don't have a picture. I should probably put a picture on here, but squiggles. it's a lot of squiggles. Like if it's something that the pharmacist can tell that like this is bad news on the EKG, like it's pretty bad. So this is one of those ones that you know, I can look at and be like, mm, that's that patient's not doing well. Um, so anywho, basically what you're seeing here is that usually if you have one drug. It, it prolongs the QT interval. It's not really such a big deal unless you happen to have, say, a congenital prolonged QT. Some people just have uh, different genetic differences that make them have a prolonged QT at baseline. Um, you, usually they are being followed by cardiology pretty closely if it's known, if it's a known issue. Um, but as soon as you start adding more and more drugs that will prolong the QT, this can become an issue. So the more prolonged it is, the more likely you are at risk for having torsades, especially with certain electrolyte imbalances. Yes? So this is not like a side effect of being like, this is just something that happens. This is yeah, something that happens. I mean, you can consider it a side effect because it's a known kind of predictable kind of thing that will happen. So, um, you know, say for instance, like, um, like I remember one patient that we had that was uh, in the 
she was there in the pediatric ICU. She was um, status post like uh, bone marrow uh, transplant. I think she's a receiver of a transplant, so she's having like graft versus host issues. A lot of those immunosuppressants she was on was prolonging QT. She was on uh, macrolide for I can't remember what she was on it for, but again, all these things. And so we're just like let's at least check an EKG to see where that QTC is at, so that we know how kind of at risk she is, right? So you know you'll have a certain number. A millisecond number that you say is kind of normal and then once it is it the more more prolonged it gets uh, the more likely they are to, to run into issues and so we look at it a lot from the toxicology standpoint because a lot of medications especially psychotropics uh, things used for you know schizophrenia antidepressants can prolong qt as well and again when people overdose on drugs they usually do it on multiple agents and so um qt prolongation towards size is a big concern that we have uh, in a lot of cases so ekgs are very very important It's a type of ventricular arrhythmia. Um, so basically what you'll end up seeing is that, I'll, let me see if it's on the next slide. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's a ventricular fibrillation, but essentially it's a, uh, they call it twisting of the points. So you'll kind of see, um, it kind of go little squiggles and then get bigger, bigger, and then go back down. It, it, uh, you should just Google it. It's a very, um, it's a very notable kind of uh, arrhythmia. So it's definitely one of those things you want to be able to like kind of pick out when you see it. Uh, I've only ever seen it once clinically, and it was pretty pretty scary. She's actually still um, still awakened with it, so somehow she's still perfusing enough, even though she's in torsades. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the other big thing we're going to be noting for um, interactions with macrolides, and this is really really important because again, this is a very commonly prescribed group of medications, um, and so this is a very common drug interaction to run into. Um, so you'll see that uh, CYP3A4 is the big CYP enzyme we talked about. It's responsible for over half of the drugs that are metabolized through the CYP enzymes, right? Super important. So anytime you see CYP3A4 interaction, ears should be perked up, right? Because that's potential testing purposes, uh, testing questions, and also for um, just so you don't kill a patient out there, right? Um, so what ends up happening is the macrolides will end up binding some of these CYP3A enzymes and CYP3A4 um, and, and form this inactive complex. So these would be a CYP3A4 inhibitor. Um, and so what that's going to do is it will lead to higher levels of other drugs that are metabolized by CYP3A4. So certain things like digoxin. That's a big one. It's an uh, antiarrhythmic drug. Um, things like theophylline, which is used for asthma, that can be very toxic if uh, kept at high levels. Um, so just be aware of those SIP interactions and be aware of um, when you need to check the medication profile for that patient prior to prescribing these, right? So make sure they're not on uh, any other heavy duty 3A4 drugs because, again, you're going to be bumping those levels up. Uh, another big one that we'll talk about when we get to the cardiology section is going to be our, some of our statins that we use for hyperlipidemia. Things like simvastatin is a SIP. 3 or 4 substrate. So if I were to inhibit that, my levels of symphostatin go up, I can see rhabdomyolysis, I can see hepatic injury, all kinds of bad stuff. So always be on the lookout for these 3 or 4 interactions. Yep. That's going to be erythromycin uh, as a stronger inhibitor than clarithromycin, which is a stronger inhibitor than azithromycin. So this is the slide I was referring to. So um, basically what you're seeing here is that there is a potassium efflux channel, which is really important for resetting and uh, repolarizing the ventricles. So again, you have your, uh, your cardiac conduction cycle. That whole last phase is where you had the repolarization of the ventricles. And so when you block that potassium efflux channel, that HERG channel, which certain drugs can do, um, you'll end up seeing that QT prolongation. And so when you prolong how long it takes for the ventricles to repolarize, you kind of increase your chances for a reentrant rhythm to come in. Um, have you guys covered like cardiology stuff yet? You'll get to it eventually, but basically there's things, um, there's like refractory periods that are involved in, in all that. So we'll, we'll talk more about it when we get to the antiarrhythmics, um, but just be aware that um, these drugs can cause QT prolongation and that um, it's an important drug interaction to note. Uh, moving on, we then have our tetracyclines. This will include tetracycline, uh, doxycycline, and minocycline, another common class of medications you might be prescribing in your future. Uh, these again will be blocking protein synthesis within uh, by, by blocking the ribosomes. Again, these are going to be bacteriostatic, and they're pretty broad spectrum for the most part. Um, you'll see they have good gram positive, good gram negative, and good anaerobic coverage. Um, so you'll see that these will be used for, you know, they don't you know, cover things like MRSA. They're not going to cover things like Pseudomonas by any means. Um, but you'll see them cover a lot of atypical bugs. So things like animal borne organisms. So things like Yersinia pestis. Um, does anyone know what else that is? The black plague, the bubonic plague, yes. Um, it'll cover, you know, so if you ever hear of like the CDC, they have recommendations if there's ever like a biological terrorism attack. Um, a lot of like the, the biological organisms, like doxycycline treats like 90% of them. So it'll probably be one you get uh, handed out by the government if that ever comes. Um, 
Uh, again, good grand positive coverage of enterococcus. Uh, has some MRSA coverage, um, but it's not going to be one of those kind of go-to drugs. So you see it used for some skin and soft tissue infections, but say a patient um, was coming with like a, you know, a, uh, you know, bacteremia, they were worried about MRSA, this probably isn't going to be one of the ones you're going to jump to because that'll be something more like a vancomycin that you'll cover there. Uh, again, some H. pylori coverage, um, but again, poor C. diff uh, uh, treatment, poor pseudomonas, so you don't really see uh, it being used for that either. Um, you'll see tetracyclines being used very frequently for acne, uh, also for atypical pneumonias, even though uh, a lot of your macrolides end up kind of supplanting that. So you'll see macrolides uh, being dosed a little bit more frequently uh, for those atypical pneumonias, but certainly things like doxycycline could be good for that. Um, Animal-borne diseases and then certain STDs like chlamydia, um, doxycycline is going to be a good one to go with. Uh, important drug interactions to note. Uh, these will chelate which means they'll bind up um, things that have iron or calcium in them. So if I were to drink milk with my doxycycline, I'm probably not going to absorb very much of it. Or if I were to take it with a multivitamin that had a lot of the, either iron or calcium in it. Uh, so it's a very important uh, interaction to let your patients know because, again, old people, they have osteoporosis, they tell them to drink lots of milk, end up having treatment failures because of things like that. So important to note that. Um, other things you can see is going to be photosensitivity. So they're going to be more prone to sunburn. So tell them to wear high SPF you know, sunscreen, things like that. They're going to be outside. Um, and another really, really important thing here is going to be this discoloration of the teeth. So um, you see doxycycline does this more than other tetracyclines, um, and you really want to avoid these medications in patients who are less than eight years of age. You also want to avoid this in uh, pregnant patients as well, because again, that can stain um, the teeth of the baby, even though it's still a fetus. Um, you can see some depression of skeletal bone growth. Um, so avoid this in pregnant ladies, avoid this in kids less than eight, unless you want their teeth to come out funky colors. Not good. Um, these also must be really dose adjusted, so keep that in mind as well. Um, one that kind of fits uh, into a similar category as the tetracyclines would be tigacycline, also known as tigacil. Um, this one is an interesting one because it has uh, very good coverage against a lot of resistant bugs, but you don't see this one being used very frequently. It's kind of one of the ones we hold in reserve for really resistant infections. Um, it still works by inhibiting um, protein synthesis. Um, it's still a bacteriostatic agent, which has some limitations, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's good for things like complicated skin infections, so especially things, um, you know, E. coli, uh, E. faecalis. It doesn't treat like vancomycin resistant enterococcus, that's what that VRE stands for. Um, but we'll cover things like MRSA. Um, it'll cover a lot of good like intra-abdominal bugs. So you'll see um, you know, anaerobics uh, being covered. You'll see a lot of gram-negative coverage here. And so a lot of times um, you'll have patients. Uh, the thing I remember um, from my rotations when I was uh, out there is that you know, I was in, working in the medical ICU and we had a patient when the, the swine flu hit, right? I was kind of dating myself, but it's when the swine flu was really big. Uh, we had patients who were getting sick with that and then they were putting, getting up. Uh, put on the ventilator, and then they get these secondary ventilator-associated pneumonias. We had this one guy who was growing out this acinetobacter. It basically was resistant to everything except for tigacycline. So we were able to, to utilize that in order to, to get that. Um, this is the one that kind of has that orange color, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Looks looks kind of cool. You had a question? Somebody? Yes. What's um, VRE? That's vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. So the problem is, is that you can use them for these really resistant uh, infections, but it's bacteriostatic. And those are usually your patients who are a little bit more sick and probably don't have that good of an immune system to begin with. So in some studies, they're actually showing increased mortality rates um, with the use of tigacycline. So it's kind of gone out of vogue, um, really only gets used for a really certain um, clinical scenario. So you probably won't see it used all that too often. Again, it has this kind of cool orange color, all the marketing had, like the doctor walking through the hallways with a big tiger next to him, which I don't really like that. Um, that was a pretty cool doctor. Um, but anyway, again, uh, very similar side effects we would see with the, some of the other tetracyclines. Um, no worry about uh, staining teeth or anything that I know of with this one. Okay, uh, another big category of drugs we'll talk about are, are aminoglycosides. This will include amikacin, gentamicin, and tobramycin. This is going to be another kind of um, one of those go-to drugs for gram-negative infections, similar to how we saw uh, vancomycin being used for our MRSA infections. So aminoglycosides really only have coverage against gram negatives, but this includes pseudomonas. Um, most of your gram negatives will be covered by this. No anaerobic coverage, no gram positives. Um, so this is really good. Uh, usually, you know, like I, I talk about the 90-year-old grandma that comes in from the nursing home. Usually what you end up doing is putting her on vancomycin for possible MRSA or other gram positive infections. You'll put them on an aminoglycoside and then to get pseudomonas coverage and then usually some other agent that's really effective against um, pseudomonas and other gram negatives um, because the idea is by double covering, at least one of those drugs will probably have gotten 
the whatever's causing the infection, and then you can streamline therapy. So it's not uncommon to have patients coming on you know healthcare acquired pneumonias uh, that will be on vancomycin, uh, say gentamicin and piperacillin, tazobactam or zosin, right? That would be a popular one. You know you could do cefepime instead of the piperacillin, um, something like that. So it's it's a very frequent combination. We'll talk more about that when we get to pulmonology and talk about pneumonias. Um, sometimes you'll see this being utilized for a gram-positive infection that would be enterococcus, but it'll be used in conjunction with something like a penicillin uh, for this synergy. Essentially what's happening is that the penicillin's kind of loosening up the cell wall and then the immune glycoside can kind of get in to work against the, uh, the protein production. Um, note here this is a bactericidal agent. Uh, it does have a bacterial killing effect, which is good for our really sick patients. Um, this one is also a concentration dependent killer. Um, traditionally, it used to be dosed every eight hours, in which case we would actually do therapeutic drug monitoring on it, and we'd actually measure peaks and troughs to make sure they're being kept at that kind of steady state um, where their troughs are not getting too high, when they're accumulating too much, uh, make sure our, our peaks are getting high enough to actually kill the bacteria. Nowadays, what you'll see more frequently is that you'll do every day, uh, every 24 hour dosing. So basically, you give them a really big dose. Uh, up front uh, one time a day and you don't really care what the peak is because you know you're giving such a high dose that it's going to get whatever you're trying to treat right and then basically what we'll end up doing is measuring trough levels to make sure that they're actually becoming negative you want to make sure that because remember we looked at our graphs of the uh, the concentration dependent killers basically you just wanted a really big peak and you want it to kind of drop down if it goes below the MIC you don't really care um, because you still have that post antibiotic effect remember that so um, if you get a level that comes back, a trough of immune glycoside comes back negative, that's okay because we don't really care. We just want to make sure that the patient's not accumulating the drug for toxicity's sake. Right. So um, big thing we're going to be seeing here, very similar to vancomycin, you were about renal toxicity and you were about ototoxicity. And that needs to be renally adjusted for. Here, just have some dosing. You see here that the, the laboratory monitoring will do, so say like tobramycin, genomycin, we'd want troughs less than one. So as long as there's anything less than one or undetectable, then we're good to go. Um, again, this will be one that requires therapeutic drug monitoring, so usually your friendly pharmacist will be helping out with this, hopefully. Um, and still, it's one you want to be checking levels before the third or fourth dose, so otherwise you'll be getting them too soon before steady state. So a lot of times what we'd end up doing uh, for patients who were getting this every eight hours and they were, we were measuring peaks and troughs, essentially what we would do is wait till say the third or fourth dose. We would actually measure a trough 30 minutes before that fourth dose and then we'd actually measure a peak level 30 minutes after. And so that way you can kind of extrapolate to say that there are steady states, so that peak level I got should have been the same as that for that previous dose. And so by using that, you can do your pharmacokinetic calculations and determine um, where their levels are at. Make sense? So more frequently, though, we're just measuring troughs for these. Uh, continuing on, we will also have our, um, yeah, that's a hard word to say, so I'm just going to say Zyvox. It's a lot easier. Uh, linazolid. Um, this is going to be very similar in coverage to our vancomycins. So linazolid or Zyvox is very, very good activity against gram positives. That's really the only thing you're going to be used to treat it for. Um, you will see that this is also effective against vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. So if you're growing VRE or say you're having vancomycin-resistant staph aureus, this is your next go-to drug, right? So if vancomycin fails or cultures come back resistant, this is the next drug you go to typically. Um, no gram negative, no anaerobic coverage really here, just gram positive. So um, you'll see this being utilized, especially if you have patients, um, sometimes what we'll do is you have patients whose renal function is so labile, so kind of hit or miss, um, that dosing the vancomycin is too difficult to keep them at a decent uh, level. We'll actually switch them over to Zyvox because this has standard dosing. You just do every 12 hours and you're set because it's much more hepatically metabolized than it is uh, going through the kidneys. Um, some of the notable toxicities, you can see some thrombocytopenia. Uh, so some blood dyscrasias there. And then the other thing here is this interaction with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We'll talk more about this when we get to antidepressants. Um, but selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors would be things like your Prozac, right? It'd be things like your Lexapros. Um, essentially, what this drug is doing is it works like an old school antidepressant. And so um, up in the CNS, you have your catecholamines, things like epinephrine, norepinephrine. They get metabolized by a few different enzymes, one of them being monoamine oxidase. Okay, monoamine oxidase will, um, if you block that the enzyme, you prevent things like serotonin from being metabolized quite so well, right? So the prevailing theory for a long time was you increase serotonin levels, you, you fix depression, right? We know it's more complicated than that, but that's kind of the, the prevailing theory decades before. Um, 
So this drug does that as well, blocks the activities of monoamine oxidase. And so if I were to have something that blocks the, in, the, the metabolism of serotonin, and then I have, say, an SSRI, which as the name implies, is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it prevents that recycling of serotonin within the neuron. So your, you know, your synaptic levels of serotonin increase as well because it can be reabsorbed into the neuron. So you have something that blocks the metabolism and something that increases the, that synaptic clef level. Um, There's just too much serotonin. And so you run into toxicity from that. So you can see things like hypertension, you see altered mental status, hyperthermia, um, all the way up to this thing called ter uh, serotonin syndrome, which I won't get into too much detail here. Um, but you can also see interactions with uh, high uh, foods that are high in tyramine, because tyramine is also a precursor for things like norepinephrine and serotonin. Um, does anyone know what foods would be high in tyramine? It's all the really good foods. So things like mm -hmm. aged meat and cheeses, um, red wine, dark chocolate, all the stuff we like to eat. Um, no fancy parties for you if you're on, on this drug uh, because of the tyramine. And then fava beans, I think, has a lot of uh, tyramine as well. So all these kind of things you have to avoid. Um, and so in a lot of cases, you know, you have a patient who, you know, some of the SSRIs, they have very long half-lives. They stick around for a period of time. And so sometimes you have to kind of run a, a risk-benefit analysis of saying, well, I can put them on Zyvox, but I worry about this interaction, but they have this really nasty infection. So it's like, well, what's going to get them first? Probably the infection, and you start that, and you discontinue the, the SSRI, right? So, so it's one of those things you have to think about uh, before prescribing is, you know, your, your risk benefit to that, right? You don't want your patient to be depressed um, because, again, coming off of an SSRI has its own uh, withdrawal reactions you worry about. So, you know, again, it's um, kind of one of those things you have to weigh the, the pros and the cons of it. Um, one other drug that would uh, fall in this category of being active against vancomycin resistant enterococcus would be another one called daptomycin, otherwise known as cubicin. Um, this one is going to work by actually depolarizing uh, the cell itself. So it actually will, by depolarizing uh, the cell, it inhibits DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. So it actually ends up being bactericidal. Um, it's a very good drug. But one of the things to note is that you cannot use it in pneumonias. And the reason for that is, is that the surfactant in the lung actually deactivates mm -hmm. the drug. So even though uh, the, you know, the VRE that you're growing might be uh, susceptible to daptomycin, if it's in the lungs, it's never going to work, right? Um, so this is more good for like really um, more good. It's better for things like bloodstream infections and, and things like that. Um, other things to note with uh, adaptomycin is you can have muscle breakdown, so you want to be looking for things like new onset muscle pain and also checking their CPK levels, uh, creatinine phosphokinase, because uh, those will be uh, increasing if you have uh, evidence of muscle breakdown. Okay, um, so the next category we'll talk about are fluoroquinolones. Again, another very popular uh, group of medications. There are more than just these three, but these are probably the big ones you'll see used most often. So levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. Pretty easy to at least discern the names here. Their mechanism of action is that they're going to be inhibiting uh, two different enzymes. So one's going to be DNA gyrase, otherwise known as topoisomerase 2, and they also will inhibit topoisomerase 4. These enzymes are really important for relaxing the superhelical structure of DNA in order to allow for, uh, it kind of has these controlled strand breaks and allow them to kind of unwind to allow for, um, you know, RNA transcription and things like that, or translation to occur. Um, so by inhibiting these enzymes, you prevent these strand breaks from happening, and eventually it leads to uh, more uh, DNA damage, it eventually leads to uh, the cell-inducing apoptosis at that point, right? So these would be bactericidal because they're preventing DNA from being reproduced, preventing any proteins from being produced, so um, these will be bactericidal agents. So um, important things to note with our uh, fluoroquinolones, hopefully I don't pick up the helicopter coming in over this. Um, for community-acquired pneumonias, um, typically you don't use uh, ciprofloxacin super commonly. Um, this has kind of shoddy uh, pseudomonas coverage, so it's kind of plus or minus on that. So you don't see a lot for community-acquired pneumonias. You do see um, ciprofloxacin used a lot for UTIs, though. Um, you can use it for things like uh, uh, hospital-acquired pneumonias, although you're going to be using higher doses, um, sinusitis, otitis, a lot of upper respiratory tract infections, and then uh, also UTIs. And then it's important to note for UTIs that moxifloxacin is not a good agent for that. Main reason is, is that it is metabolized in the liver and thus it does not achieve very high levels within the kidneys and within the bladder and the urinary tract. Yes? Yes. So for UTIs, moxifloxacin is not a good option because it is metabolized within the liver. And so it really never gets to high enough levels within the urinary tract to really provide any kind of anti antibiotic activity. Um, 
The other ones though, are renally eliminated primarily, so you do need to dose adjust those, but Moxie is not going to be one of those ones. Um, Again, you'll see it for some other things, especially if you have like kind of atypical, like especially gram negative bugs that are causing like skin, certain skin infections and osteomyelitis, so you might see them there. Important drug interactions to note. Um, one, this will also bind with iron, antacids, multivitamins, calcium, any of the iron chelations uh, that can occur. This is one to note. Um, this, these can also prolong the QT interval. So you can again, be more at risk for torsade, especially with multiple agents on board. And then this can also cause some CNS toxicity. So this is one of the things in older patients you want to be aware of. And again, it's, it's tough to tell with older patients, like, you know, you know, are they getting really kind of, you know, is their dementia getting worse? Are they, do they have a new UTI and now they're altered? Uh, is it the medication that I'm giving them? Lots of different things that can happen um, that can really knock an old person for a loop from a CNS perspective. So it's important to kind of note that, okay, well, it could be any of these one things, but note that they're on a fluoroquinolone, so maybe it's related to that. Um, and then you also run some uh, potential interactions with warfarin, and we mentioned that last time as warfarin being an anticoagulant. Um, you see, it can prolong the bleeding time, uh, can make bruising and bleeding more common uh, when these two are on board together. Um, these are tragically overused, and we see lots and lots of resistance developing to these agents, uh, mainly because they're so effective and they do have a pretty wide spectrum. Um, so you end up having a lot of C. difficile infections you worry about, and just resistance rates that make it uh, almost useless in, in a lot of clinical settings. Um, you don't have to really know the different generations of fluoroquinolones quite so much as we do for something like the cephalosporins because there's a lot more overlap with the different coverages of the generations here. Um, so I do this for just more to kind of note the, a few of the differences here. Um, so ciprofloxacin would be considered one of our uh, second generation fluoroquinolones, um, has good atypical coverage, good gram negative coverage, and again, plus or minus on the pseudomonas. So, you know, if you're trying to treat a pseudomonal infection, Cipro is not the one you really want to hang your hat on, uh, so to speak. Uh, again, this is going to be dosed every 12 hours, but maybe extended depending on the renal function for the patient. Um, but yeah, these, these will still be good for a UTI. So Cipro is definitely a good drug uh, for that. And then you have your, uh, yes. No, because usually the coverages are so, like, they, they just overlap so much that it's just easier just to know that, like, okay, you know, Cipro has, you know, kind of pseudomonas coverage, but it'll still cover things like, you know, atypicals and things like that. Um, you don't get as much bang for your buck as knowing that, like, you know, as I go up in cep uh, cephalosporin generations, I get better gram negatives, but lose gram positives and, and all that. So. Um, Levofloxacin is a uh, has very similar coverage to the second generation, but has improved gram positive coverage. Um, this definitely does have good activity against pseudomonas as long as resistance hasn't popped up. Um, you will see these a lot used for uh, community acquired pneumonias, especially strep pneumo, and for its atypical coverage, so it's really good for that. But again, this is one of the main places where it gets overused for things like you know sinusitis and then um, community acquired pneumonias and things like that. Um, again, renal dosing adjustments uh, do need to be made as well if you have renal impairment. There's also another drug that we'll see in the fluoroquinolone group when we get to the ENT section, uh, either ENT or ophthalmology, but it's ofloxacin. Um, you guys ever heard of the, um, you know, the differences between ofloxacin and levofloxacin, if you had to guess? Not just that where you apply it, but the actual chemical structures themselves. Not the way the R groups, well, yeah, actually, so it has to do with chirality. So you guys remember back to your uh, organic chemistry um, that when you have a lot of these drugs, many of them are racemic mixtures, right? So there's left-handed and right-handed molecule, right? Um, for some drugs, it's thought to say that, you know, the, the efficacy comes from, say, one version of it, and maybe some of the toxicity comes from the other one. So anytime you see like a Levo or a Lev or something like that in front of a drug's name, chances are there is another drug out there that is a racemic mixture, and this is one of those versions of it, right? So you have ofloxacin, which is a racemic mixture, but then you have levofloxacin, which is kind of the left-handed version. You know, you have albuterol, which is good for asthma, but then you have leave albuterol as well. You know, so if you ever see that, um, uh, if you see S or ES in front of any, that might be one as well. So there's citalopram, which is a, a SSRI, um, but you also have escitalopram. A lot of times you get brand new patents out of this when you are able to extract one out, and so you get more time to make money on your brand names. Um, mm -hmm. That's just an aside, uh, but you, you will see that sometimes. But levoquin is, is a, a you know legitimate usage uh, of separating out one of those um, those handed molecules. Uh, moxifloxacin uh, would be uh, very similar coverage. Um, so we'll have some gram, uh, gram negative coverage, we'll have some pseudomonas coverage, um, but again you'll see it used a lot in pneumonias, but not for UTIs due to the fact that it's metabolized within the liver. 
Um, but again, because it is metabolizing the liver, um, you don't have to worry about renal dose adjustment. So it could be better for some of those patients who have um, renal impairment. So again, like we mentioned, you have some complexant with cations like iron and calcium that we worry about with our fluoroquinolones. You can see some hypersensitivity. The CYP P450 interactions, I wouldn't focus on too much here since they don't inhibit 3A4. There's not like a ton of meds that get metabolized by the CYP1A2, um, but it would be something to, um, if you just ever just run a drug interaction report just to make sure there's nothing um, significant there. Again, for everything except for moxifloxacin, look for renal elimination, look for renal dose adjustments, look at QT prolongation. And then another unique thing with the fluoroquinolones, um, it can cause tendinitis and also potential for tendon rupture. Um, so especially for young children, um, this might be one you want to avoid. Um, and then especially it's a good patient counseling point to say like, hey, if you start to notice, you know, you're having new onset, you know, tendon pain or muscle pain, you know, some of the, you know, would uh, be described as tendon pain, um, you know, stop therapy, give us a call, we'll get you something else, you know, to, to treat your infection. Um, but certainly there are case reports of, of you know, Achilles tendon or Achilles tendon uh, rupture um, that have occurred in, in young children. Yes? Um, is there a first Generation for this group of drugs? There are. So, like, ofloxacin would fall into that, but that's one that we're really going to use more topically, um, either in an ophthalmic or an odic sense. So, I just didn't mention it here. because we're, Yeah, it's really the ones to focus on. Yeah. For, there's lots of others like Gaddy floxus and Jimmy floxus, but a lot of them we're not using clinically here in the U.S., so I'm not, I'm not going to focus on those. Okay, uh, another drug we have here is going to be clindamycin. This is a, another category, it's not a fluoroquinolone, um, otherwise known as cleosin. Um, this drug also has kind of a unique coverage spectrum in, in that it covers gram positives and it covers anaerobes, but no gram negative coverage. The other nice thing about this is it does have some MRSA activity. So we'll be able to be used for that. So you see um, clindamycin being used a lot for skin and soft tissue infections. You see being used a lot for things like osteomyelitis, um, some surgical prophylaxis. And then uh, you may see it being used in uh, intra-abdominal uh, infections. But keep in mind, it doesn't cover any gram-negative. So you'd have to use it in combination with something else. So you use this to cover your anaerobes, and then you'd have something else to cover the gram-negative um, uh, bugs, right? Um, other thing you might see this being used for is in combination with some other medications for um, toxic shock syndrome. Um, essentially what this can do is actually block the production of certain exotoxins uh, for some gram-positive uh, bugs. So um, even though it's not being used to actually treat the infection, it is used to help um, blunt the effect of a lot of those um, uh, toxins that are being released, re released by the bacteria in order to help prevent some of the shock that develops there. So I'm sure you'll learn about that later. Um, other big thing to note with this is that you'll see diarrhea being a much more common side effect with clindamycin, and this one, uh, more so than others, are more likely to cause C. difficile colitis. So be very aware of that. You know, if you're noticing, you know, really uh, significant diarrhea, patients are not able to really stay hydrated. Um, this could be a, a good sign that C. diff is popping up here. You may need to do a test to run for it. Um, but this is more so uh, related to clindamycin. You'll see with a lot of other drugs. It can happen with other drugs, but clindamycin seems to be more likely. Um, in some cases, it's just going to happen because um, anytime you're disrupting that gut flora, you know, you, you run the risk of having C. Uh, diff, you know, just kind of take an opportunity there to, to you know, get a place there. Um, some people will recommend giving um, like probiotics along with it. I don't know if there's any actual literature out there that would say that that will, has been shown to prevent C. diff from uh, uh, getting a hold in the, in the GI tract, but um, I, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there, but certainly some people will recommend probiotics in order to help kind of reestablish the gut flora. Okay, uh, another group of medications we'll talk about are going to be uh, this combination drug. Uh, it's going to be sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Um, so these are going to be working via two different mechanisms to inhibit the folic acid um, utilization within bacteria. Um, so essentially what we see here is that sulfamethoxazole is going to be inhibiting the conversion of para-aminobenzoic acid, otherwise known as PABA, over to dihydrofolic acid, right? It's going to be inhibiting that enzyme. Um, this tetrahydropateric acid synthase inhibits that. And then on the other side of it, you have trimethoprim, which is inhibiting the conversion of dihydrofolic acid over to tetrahydrofolic acid. Yes? How in depth do you want us to know these amylids? Like, do you want us to know these like? You should know that... Um, these guys are going to be inhibited. I don't expect you to know all the enzyme names for this particular mechanism. Just know that these two are working via different mechanisms in order to help prevent the utilization of folic acid in the bacteria, right? And if I can't use folic acid, I can't produce a lot of base pairs and inhibits DNA synthesis, um, and that's how you get your, your bacterial activity. And it's bacteriocidal? 
Um, this one is bactericidal, right? Because you're inhibiting uh, DNA from being formed. Yeah. Um, so this one is going to have uh, good coverage against MRSA. So you'll see this used a lot for skin and soft tissue infections. Um, that will have some coverage against listeria and, and strep pneumo. Um, does not cover enterococci, so kind of similar to your um, cephalosporins in that uh, regard. And then you'll have some good coverage against some gram negatives. Um, you'll actually see that uh, Bactrim has uh, Bactrim is, uh, or Septra is a brand name for for this drug. Um, you will have it have some activity against some kind of oddball bacteria that um, you don't see a lot of other cases. So things like um, Burkholdia sepatia, things like Stenotrophomonas multophilia. Those are opportunistic infections we see in things like you know in stage CF uh, patients and things like that. So sometimes you have Bactrim being utilized for that. Um, this is also good for certain opportunistic infections in patients like uh, have you know HIV or AIDS. Um, so things like pneumocystis carinae, um, nocardia, toxoplasmosis. Um, this is also going to be good for coverage against those. So sometimes you'll see patients who are, say, you know, receiving chemo or uh, you know, severely neutropenic or they have HIV AIDS, um, in which case they will have um, be on these medications for prophylaxis. And so if you ever see someone who's on Bactrim, say, on you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's usually for prophylaxis against something like pneumocystis carinae um, versus if they're on it every single day, that's going to be more for treatment purposes. So something odd you might see uh, that does make sense if you look it up. Um, like I said, the PCP says that pneumocystis carinae uh, pneumonia treatment and prophylaxis. Um, you'll see it used a lot for some UTIs because it's going to be able to hit some of these kind of normal, um, normal causative organisms here like Klebsiella, E. coli. Um, I don't say it used too much for respiratory tract infections, but certainly could be uh, used for that. And then it's also good for certain GI infections, so things like you know, traveler's diarrhea, Shigella, whatnot. Um, side effects are good to know for Septra just because um, allergies can be a big thing um, and some of these other drug interactions. So um, certainly, uh, you know, rash and hypersensitivity can be a big thing, especially because you, know, you have a sulfonamide uh, medication right there. So if someone has a sulfa allergy, typically they're referring to a sulfonamide um, antibiotic when, when they say that. Um, certainly run the risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So there's another one to note uh, that can cause that with some, uh, not regularity, but if it's going to be one of these antibiotics, you know, is going to be one of the, the major ones you think of. And then you can also see some blood dyscrasias, so things like thrombocytopenia, granulocytosis, um, not too, too commonly, but, but can occur. Um, and then potentially uh, some hepatotoxicity. You will see uh, these drug interactions here, and this is important to note these um, because it can change your levels of, of some medications that have narrow therapeutic indexes. So things like, you know, phenytone levels can be increased. That's an antiepileptic. Um, digoxin, which is an antiarrhythmic. Um, you don't need to know the specific drugs for this case, but just know that, you know, it's going to be inhibiting the, in, the metabolism of some of these drugs and can lead to super therapeutic concentrations. Um, you know, things like decreased renal clearance of methotrexate is really important because if I'm giving this to a patient who is receiving chemo, methotrexate is a drug I commonly give for chemotherapy. Um, you can see that interaction there where you can actually end up seeing a worsened you know, bone marrow suppression for the methotrexate because I'm not clearing it as well. You know, so it's one of those things where it's kind of a necessary evil sometimes to, to give both drugs at the same time. Um, and then the other thing is that there is a CYP2C9 interaction here where it will actually inhibit the metabolism of warfarin and so your warfarin is going to be more effective and thus increase your INR. Again, we said INR is just a way of measuring how um, quickly the blood is clotting. A higher INR means the blood is clotting less quickly and you're more likely to bleed. Um, any questions on that? So 2C9 is another important one to know for warfarin uh, interactions. Do you have a question? OK, you did. So you, you just make sure that if a person's on like warfarin and they're coming in or something that you would not get them back so you can try to avoid Bactrim if you can. You know, if they were on warfarin and you knew about it, um, sometimes you can decrease your dose of warfarin. Um, sometimes it'll like decrease it by half, uh, and then you can recheck your INR to see where they're at in a few days. Um, you know, because usually these are going to be short-term courses of the drug. You know, say you know you'll be on it for seven days, I'll just drop your warfarin dose by half. And you know, so there there are guidelines out there to kind of help you uh, to guide around that. Um, otherwise, you would just start the Bactrim and then you know let your patient know, hey, come back in a day or two so I can check your INR, and then also. If you notice any new bleeding, bruising, come back and get that fixed up, right? Uh, another drug uh, that is useful in specific circumstances will be metronidazole, otherwise known as Flagyl. Um, this is one that actually has some antiparasitic activity. So for parasites, I um, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, but um, 
like Giardia and things like that, you can utilize it for that. Um, but this also has really good anaerobic coverage, um, and it does it by interacting with the bacterial DNA, and it, um, again, leads to that strain breakage and, and interruption of the DNA. So again, this would be bactericidal. Um, Good gram positive anaerobes, um, good gram negative anaerobes, but no real like gram positive or gram negative coverage itself. So oftentimes um, you'll see it being util um, utilized for things like you know um, certain vaginal infections. You can see it utilized in combination with other meds as well to help increase its coverage. Um, so um, you know the other thing that this is unique that it can be used for is for uh, C diff. So we mentioned vancomycin can be used orally alone. Um, or you can utilize flagell as either IV or PO. And so actually uh, met, uh, metronidazole PO is your kind of your go-to drug first line for C. difficile. And then if it becomes, um, you know, if you're not treating it uh, appropriately or if it's um, getting worse, you can add on vancomycin at that point. So this is your kind of go-to drug for that. Um, again, certain sexually transmitted infections. And then if you add it in combination with the other drugs, then you can use it for intra-abdominal infections. Because again, we said, you know, a lot of gram negatives, a lot of anaerobes in, in, the, uh, in the gut. Um, so oftentimes like for, you know, say for instance, over at Nemours for um, surgical prophylaxis for complicated appendicitis, say you had ruptured appendicitis, you're worried about, you know, leakage of, you know, anaerobes and gram negatives into the, the abdominal cavity. We would use metronidazole plus ceftriaxone in order to help get that coverage to kill most of the bacteria we're looking for as kind of um, as prophylaxis. Um, the big side effect to note with metronidazole is this disulfiram-like reaction. You guys ever heard of this reaction before? So the metabolism of al alcohol happens via two different enzymes. So the, the first step is that you have alcohol dehydrogenase, which converts alcohol over to acetaldehyde. Mm -hmm. And then you have acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, which converts acetaldehyde into, you know, eventually goes to CO2 and water, basically. So there's a drug called disulfiram, which actually inhibits that acetaldehyde dehydrogenase and leaves you with too much acetaldehyde around. And acetaldehyde is what causes flushing, causes you to get sick and throw up and all this kind of bad stuff. So disulfiram was a drug, uh, the brain name was antabuse, and it was meant to uh, curtail alcohol abuse. And so basically you give it to your patient, uh, and then if they drink alcohol, then they get super sick, throw up, and they say, I'm never gonna drink again. Uh, imagine how well the compliance was for, for that medication. Not great. But metronidazole has a similar reaction, and so it can block the activity of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase and prevent the, um, the acetaldehyde from actually being broken down. So that's uh, so warn your patients don't be drinking alcohol with this because otherwise you may get really sick and flushed and just feel really terrible. Um, one other uh, group of medications we'll talk about. This one uh, you'll see used mainly topically, the polymyxins. Um, very rarely do we use it systemically, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. Um, but essentially what it's doing is acting as kind of a detergent and kind of poking a hole um, within the gram-negative rod's outer membrane. And by doing that, you kind of lice it open and allow contents to flow out like magnesium and calcium. Um, so they're definitely bactericidal. They have great gram-negative coverage. Uh, but the problem is, is they're super, super toxic. Very old medications. So um, because we haven't had a lot of use of them in the last 50 years, there's no really a good acquired resistance. And so um, sometimes what you'll actually end up seeing is that if you have uh, patients, especially in ICUs, who have bugs that are resistant to everything else, gram-negative bugs, um, this might be the last thing you go to, right? Um, basically because it's either that or they're just not going to get treated with anything. So sometimes you use these systemically. Um, now, we don't like to use these because they are very, very toxic. You know, to topically applied, you don't get a lot of absorption, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but when given systemically, you worry about things like nephrotoxicity, neurotoxicity, and it can actually increase the activity of certain drugs that are paralytics. So you can actually end up seeing your patients being paralyzed for a longer period of time than what you would expect them to be um, based on that drug interaction. So that's it for the antibiotics. Any questions on these? So the quiz will end here. The quiz will end here. Um, I'm going to start on the derm section in just a second. A good question. Anything else I can answer for this section? Okay.